Josiah was eight years old when he became king, and he reigned in Jerusalem 31 years. His mother was Jedidiah, daughter of Adiah from Boscoth. He did what was pleasing in the Lord's sight and followed the example of his ancestor David. He did not turn away from doing what was right. In the 18th year of his reign, King Josiah sent Shaphan, son of Azalea, and the grandson of Meshelam, court secretary, to the temple of the Lord. He told him, Go to Hilkiah, the high priest, and have him count the money the gatekeepers have collected from the people at the Lord's temple. Entrust this money to the men assigned to supervise the temple's restoration. Then they can use it to pay workers to repair the temple of the Lord. They will need to hire carpenters, builders, and masons. Also have them buy the timber and the finished stone needed to repair the temple. But don't require the construction supervisors to keep account of the money they receive, for they are honest and trustworthy men. Hilkiah, the high priest, said to Shaphan, the court secretary, I found the book of the law in the Lord's temple. Then Hilkiah gave the scroll to Shaphan, and he read it. Shaphan went to the king and reported, Your officials have turned over the money collected at the temple of the Lord to the workers and supervisors at the temple. Shaphan also told the king, Hilkiah the priest has given me a scroll. So Shaphan read it to the king. When the king heard what was written in the book of the law, he tore his clothes in despair. Then he gave these orders to Hilkiah the priest, Achim son of Shaphan, Ak Akbar son of Micaiah, Shaphan the court secretary, and Asia the king's personal advisor, Go to the temple and speak to the Lord for me and to the people, speak to the Lord for me and for the people and for all of Judah. Inquire about the words written in this scroll that has been found. For the Lord's anger is great and is burning against us because our ancestors have not obeyed the words in this scroll. We have not been doing everything it says we must do. Here ends the reading. All right, uh, as usual, you get no guarantee that any of those pronunciations were correct. So if you ever hear anybody pronounce it differently, they're probably right, not me. So, All right, King Josiah, one of the very few good kings of Israel. Now, way back in the beginning of the time of the kings, when Israel was pestering God for a king because they wanted to be just like all the other nations surrounding them, God warned the people again and again, you guys do not want a king. The king would not be a good thing for you, but the people persisted, and God gave them a king. And you know their first king was Saul. You know the history of the Bible? You know that didn't work out so well for them. After Saul came another king, King David. And while David was certainly far from perfect, and he was a much beloved king, uh, he, everybody loved him. He was kind of the gold standard. The next king after him was King Solomon, and from there there's a long list of kings. The kingdom eventually splits into the northern and the southern kingdoms. Some kings were good. Most kings were bad. But if you had to name a king other than David who was good, one of the few names you're going to be able to come up with is Josiah. Now, Josiah is an interesting king. He came along late enough in the process that Israel had split into two kingdoms, and Jos Josiah was the king over the southern kingdom of Judah. Now, Josiah was many generations removed from the days of King David, but as you can see in this passage, David was still the example everybody looked at. You'll also notice in this passage I read that Josiah was beloved. If you read through the books of Kings, you're not going to read too many of the kings that the author was willing to say, he did what was pleasing in the sight of the Lord. That was a sentence they didn't have opportunity to say very often because it most of the time was not true. So God had warned them in the beginning, you know, kings, not what you guys want. And to everybody's great surprise, they eventually found out that God was right. The king was a bad idea. The kings struggled to be good for the people. And Josiah ends up being one of the rare exceptions. Now, okay, knowing now that there were very few kings of Israel that were good for Israel and Judah, if I gave you a brief description of each king... And I said, okay, based on this brief description, which ones do you think were good? Would you choose Josiah? If all you knew was what I read to you in the first verse today, would you pick Josiah out as one of the good kings? Let me remind you what that first verse tells us. Josiah was eight years old when he became king. Just based on that sentence, do you think that Josiah would be one of the good kings? No. Why? Because we all have met an eight-year-old before, right? So it says here he was king and he was eight. Do you know what that kind of power does to a kid who's nowhere near mature enough to deal with it? 
Now, yes, Josiah goes on to become one of the good kings. And even though there were plenty of other kings who came along both before and after him who had a whole lot more potential to be good, Josiah overcomes what most of us would agree was a less than ideal circumstance to become one of the few good kings that we have recorded in our Bible. Friends, understand, Josiah had a lot to overcome, more than just being king at eight years old. I mean, if Josiah becomes the king at eight years old, that meant that all the other men in his family who were in line to become king must have died. That means his grandfather, his father, his uncles, his older male cousins, his older brothers, they either had to be dead or not exist at all, one or the other. So there were a lot of things that had to go wrong to end up with Josiah being king at eight years old. Now, for those of you who've either been in the small group or will be in the small group, you're going to find out that there's a lot more that did go wrong leading up to the situation, but you'll talk about that in your groups this week. However, for our purposes here this morning, suffice it to say, Josiah had a lot to deal with, and he had a lot to deal with at a very young age. Josiah literally rose from the ashes of his father's execution to become one of the few good kings of Israel. He reigned for 31 years. And again, if you go and look at all the kings, there were some that reigned longer than him, but 31 years was a pretty good amount of time. How did that happen? I mean, how did he do it? And my <laughs> friends, there were two things in Josiah's life that helped him keep his feet on the ground and empowered him to overcome the challenges that he faced early in his life. The first thing that Josiah did is revealed in the details that are recorded here in this passage that we read. It says, in the 18th year of his reign, Josiah started a renovation project of the temple. Okay, so let's do a little math. If Josiah became king when he was eight, 18 years later, he would have been 26. Have you ever met a 26-year-old before? Right? And you guys are tired or what? Anybody met a 26? Does anybody know a 26-year-old? How much different are they from the eight-year-old? Answer is, not that much, right? So what kind of 26-year-old would you think Josiah would be after having spent nearly two-thirds of his life as the king? Would we expect to find a benevolent and God-fearing king, or would we expect to find a spoiled brat? Spoiled brat. Okay, that's what we would expect. The king would most likely be spending his money to glorify himself. However... That's not what we find Josiah doing. He is renovating the temple. He's taking care of God's house. Now this clues us in on what Josiah prioritized in his life. Last week we talked about making sacrifices in the name of love. Josiah is now putting considerable resources into the renovation of the temple. Gives us very strong indication, Josiah loved God. More on that in a second. The second part of the renovation I find interesting is exactly how Josiah goes about this renovation. So he gets, he gets his guys together and he says, all right, we're gonna, we're gonna do this project. And he tells them, okay, go to the workers. Give them the money they need to go buy supplies and hire workers. Make sure they have everything they need. Don't cut corners, buy the best we can get. We don't wanna skimp on this project, make it good. And then Josiah says, oh, and by the way, don't bother getting an account of the money because these guys are all trustworthy. He was willing to trust that they would do what was right. My friends, would a spoiled 26-year-old be willing to do this? No way. A spoiled 26-year-old who saw himself as above these lowly workers would never have given them the freedom to do something like this without tight oversight. Yet Josiah doesn't do this. He trusts them. There can only be one reason why Josiah is willing to trust these workers that much. Josiah knew them. He knew these workers. No way would he have opened himself up to this kind of criticism and take this kind of risk unless he knew what kind of fine and upstanding men these workers were. You know, he may have been the king, but he was clearly connected to his people. He must have gone down and had conversations with them. He didn't just know them to say, man, look at this great work that they do. It was more than that. He said, look at the great work they do and look how good they are. He knew it takes time for someone in a high position like Josiah to put in the time and the effort to know what kind of people he had working for him. So much so that he was able to trust them with what the scripture tells us appears to be 
an unlimited supply of money. Trying to figure out what would happen to me if I went to the BLT meeting. So I got this project I want to do, and I need unlimited money with no accountability. Can we go ahead and vote on that now? Right. Everybody's like, nope, we're not doing that. Forget it. Yeah, I'm turning that down in a hurry. All right. We're not going to do that. The bean counters in our church would start bleeding from the eye sockets if I even made such a request, right? So what this move shows us is Josiah was clearly connected to the common people in his kingdom. He trusted them. It's no wonder why this man was so beloved. Everybody knew him. He took time to know people. He took time to talk to people. He took time to connect to people. And he was not afraid to trust them when there was a job to get done. Josiah knew his people. He was connected to them. And to show just how connected Josiah was, when his workers found something in the renovation, I'm assuming they were probably tearing up the floor, and they found an old scroll. Now that seems like a weird thing to find under the floor. And as we're going to learn in the small group conversations this week, Josiah's father and grandfather were not exactly God-fearing men. They had introduced paganism into the temple, which is why probably the renovation was happening now to get all the pagan influence out of the temple. So this means this scroll was probably hidden under the floor by a scribe trying to protect the scroll when all this paganism was coming in. And he had done that years and years prior to Josiah's workers finding it. Paper was a priceless commodity. And what happened is that they had this old scroll of the law. They weren't using it, so one of the scribes buried it under the floor to protect it. Again, generations prior to Josiah coming to power. Written documents, ones especially as important as the law, they were too valuable to be discarded, so they were buried in sacred places. The document would have been sealed in a jar and buried under the temple during a renovation and left much like a time capsule. So when the workers were clearing out the floor and kind of getting things moved around, they pulled it out and they're like, whoa, what do we have here? And they would have treated that object with the same kind of respect that we would have treated an archaeological find today. So they took it to their superiors and said, hey, uh, we found this. And the superiors were like, okay, we'll take that. And if that scroll kind of works its way around up the ranks until somebody says, hey, uh, Josiah, we found something you might want to take a look at. Found something under the floor. Josiah says, read it to me. Here's the amazing part. They opened the scroll. They began to read it. And Josiah knew what it was. He knew it was the book of the law of Moses, a document hundreds of years old. And when jo Josiah recognized those sacred words and he immediately knew what they were, he took a humbled position and he sent out an edict that says, guys, things going to change around here. It's amazing considering the very low view the preceding kings took toward the law. The word of the Lord, it was going to be followed once again. So from this passage, what do we learn? We learn that Josiah was connected to the people of his kingdom because he knew he could trust them with money for this project. Also, we know just Josiah was connected to God because he recognized God's word when he heard it even though it had not been read very much in previous generations. The only way Josiah could have done both of those things is if Josiah was connected to both of those things in meaningful ways. See, had Josiah not known his workers, had he not trusted his people, and he tried to go down and micromanage the reconstruction project, it's possible the book of the law would never have been found in the first place. However, once it was found, if Josiah didn't know God, they would have brought him this old, dirty old scroll to him, start reading it. He said, I don't have time for this. Throw that thing away. Doesn't even matter. Didn't do that. He recognized what he had. And the reason that Josiah's reform was able to happen is because Josiah showed devotion both to God and to other people. Without that, the scroll either doesn't get found or it doesn't get read or they don't know what it is and nothing changes after that. All of Josiah's reforms came out of the good that came from his reign and all the good things he did by pulling Judah back from the brink all came from the fact that Josiah knew God and Josiah knew his people. A young man who grew up in the most privileged of circumstances. 
If anyone ever had a reason to go down the wrong path, Josiah would have been that man. He literally walked the valley of temptation. And he came out the other side. He made it. Now, I know, actually, King Josiah, many of you today may, may never have even heard of him before. But I know certainly that Josiah is not one we usually look at as an example of how to overcome adversity. But somehow, this eight-year-old king grew into a 26-year-old man who led a reformation that pulled the nation of Judah back in line with God's will, at least for a short time. Josiah's grandfather, whose name was Manasseh, he began to lead the nation of Judah into paganism, allowing a lot of foreign influence to come in. Josiah's father, Ammon, he continued to lead the people in the wrong direction. Because of that, Ammon only reigned for two years. Josiah then comes to power at eight years old, has a lot of turmoil to deal with. And from what we can establish, lots of bad things were happening. He didn't have very many good influences around him growing up. So friends, this is proof to me that the storms of life can come in many different forms. People in Josiah's family died. His life was in turmoil. And you could bet with a king this young, many people wanted to kill him and take power which would have created a tremendous power vacuum. Honestly, it's a miracle the eight-year-old got the chance to grow up at all, let alone grow up into a good man. And the only thing that I can see that got Josiah through was the fact that he stayed connected to real people and he stayed connected to the one real God, no matter how insane his situation got. In this way, Josiah, was, to, to this very day, is still an example and a challenge to us. For Josiah to stay connected to God, and for Josiah to stay connected to other people, would have taken effort on his part. Look, he could have locked himself away in a palace, had plenty to eat, plenty of stuff to entertain him, but he didn't do that. He became a man of the people. And because of that, he ended up leading a nation of people back from the brink of destruction. Josiah's story illustrates how important connection is. How many real people do you have in your life? This means, how many people do you have in your life, you know, not because you pay them to be there or have to have them there or you're taking care of them. How many people do you have in your life are there because they legitimately have a vital place in your life? How many do, of those relationships do you nurture on a daily basis? See, Josiah had to maintain a connection with these workers. Because look, just because he may have known them a couple of years ago doesn't mean he's going to be willing to trust them with all this money now. The only way he was willing to do this is because he had continued to nurture those relationships. And he did that because those relationships were important to him. Look, he was the king. He didn't have to do anything he didn't want to do. But he chose to keep those relationships with these people because he felt they were important. What were those workers going to do for him? Yeah, they'd probably do a good job in the work that they were doing. But what could they really do for him? Nothing he really needed. You know, these were people who weren't in his life because they were sucking up to him or anything like that. These workers were people that Josiah knew. They were his friends and they served him well. Are you nurturing relationships like that? Are you taking time to develop and maintain relationships like that? I hope you are. Because you need them. And the same warning goes for God as well. Look, when they unrolled that old scroll and they started reading it, and when Josiah heard the words of the law being read, he knew exactly what they had found in the floor of the temple. He recognized it even though clearly his grandfather and his father had obviously never read it to him like they should have. Josiah knew God's word when he heard it read. Why? Because Josiah knew God. Do you? How is your devotional life? Are you spending time in God's word? Are you spending time in prayer? Are you putting forth the effort into your relationship with God so that you'll know God's voice when you hear it? Because Josiah would never have recognized what that scroll was unless he was connected to God. Josiah knew how to listen. He knew how to listen to important people and he knew how to listen to God. Just like you know how to listen to special people in your life. There is an art to listening to God. And if every minute of your every day is spent trying to race to something that you're already late for, then God's voice is going to be very difficult to discern amidst all the other noise in your life. It's going to be tough to hear it when you're living in the middle of a hurricane all the time. 
That's why I truly love this time that we have on Sunday morning. You know, when the music is playing and we're all singing, you know, and participating together, it's great. But this time during the sermon, this is just you and me. You and me having a conversation about God. And look, I know how your lives go. I know how my life goes. This may be the quietest 20 minutes of your whole week. And it's the time that you spend here listening to me. My prayer for these precious moments that we spend together is that you would hear God. And I pray that he sincerely doesn't sound anything like me. Unlike me, I hope that when God speaks to you, he speaks slow enough so you can catch all of it. Unlike me, right? I hear that more from the first service than from you guys. This is important because so many people in our world today are starving for God when he's there the whole time. He is present. He is there. We just don't make the effort to hear him. It's been so long since we really took the time to hear God's voice that someone can come to us and say, hey, I found this scroll under the floor. And they start to read it to us. And we may not be able to recognize God's voice in what's being read, even though God's voice is literally written on the page. Josiah didn't miss it. And I hope and pray that we don't miss it either. These are special moments when God shows up in our world and we don't want to miss them. But if we don't nurture our relationship with God through prayer, study, devotion, and quiet, it won't be God's word we find. It's going to be a dirty old scroll that we're going to throw away because we don't have time to pay attention to it. Don't be that guy. Take the time and nurture the relationship. Josiah's reform was able to happen because Josiah had healthy connections. He had good friendships with people. He had a positive relationship with God so that when the work began, he let the work go in the way it needed to. And when the scroll came to him, he knew exactly what was being read to him. He knew it because he took the time, made the investment, and had the relationship. This Josiah is just an example of what can happen when we invest the time, make the effort, try to suspend everything else going on for just a moment and have a moment of serene silence and quiet to hear what God may be wanting to say, to have that moment of devotion. Friends, when we make that investment and we take the time and we find ourselves connected, we may realize we're hearing God's voice from a lot more places than we realized. Truly, we are better together. So my friends, may you go forward and enjoy that connection with each other and enjoy that connection with God, and may you do so in Jesus' name. Amen.